It was my grandmother who introduced me to the magic of cinema. A dream within a dream. Pop in. I came to Australia for a visit. Hey, Mom. And I stayed for the rest of my life. I don't actually remember Australian film without David Stratton. They're kind of inseparable. David is so much a part of the Australian film culture. He loves cinema. My first experience of Australian cinema was The Overlanders. Good on you, mate. Good on you, digger. I didn't know it then, but it began a love affair with this country and its cinema. You know, you get to see our traits in our movies and remind ourselves that that's who we are. The greatest little country in the world, no risk. You white bastard. You black bastard. <laughs> We are a nation of storytellers. That's pretty goddamn special. Never let the truth get in the way of a good yarn. <laughs> These stories are more than stories. They do give us insight into ourselves, into our relationships. <laughs> You're terrible, Muriel. Can I drive? <laughs> a nation found its identity through cinema, and so did I. This is going straight to the pool room. This is my journey through the movies that made our nation. Four years ago, it was hard leaving my family behind in England. But over time, I've become part of another kind of family here, the film industry. I'm Margaret Pomeroy. And I'm David Stratton. Looking back on 28 years. It was a grand ride, really, wasn't it? Here's to longevity. Huh? The idea of what makes a family is a rich theme in Australian cinema. Cheers, biggies. It's complex terrain, that stuff about your relationships with siblings, your relationships with parents. Always a smart ass. It's about opening our eyes to different people's lives. Do you have a photo of your wife that we could have, please? In Australian films, the stories of families reflect our values and our vastly different communities. We're going there! But families don't just share blood. Families are also tribes, united by faith, culture, and even darker motives. There you go. This is a journey through the diverse family threads that make us Australian. This should be fun. You excited, Jimmy? I guess. Come on, we'll get some beers. Take your car. Back checks. For Australian filmgoers, the building behind me is one of the most famous houses in Australia except that it's not a house. It's a home. It's the castle. He's dreaming. Perhaps more than any other Australian film, the castle encapsulates love in a nuclear family. At the centre of this story about the close-knit Kerrigan tribe is Dad, Daryl. But their togetherness is threatened when the airport wants to expand Jesus. and destroy their beloved home. You've got one too. Got what? When I first saw The Castle, I found it a film of caricature. I, it was a caricature that I was uncomfortable with. Well, I'm afraid it wasn't for me, Margaret. I, I really didn't get onto the wavelengths of this film. I think it's a very Australian sort of humour. Well, I'll give it one and a half. Oh, David. As you can see, I put a fair bit of work into it. And I also thought the aesthetics of the film were pretty awful. Gives a place a Victoriana feel. What do you mean, the, the aesthetics of it? They were my own Ugg boots. My own genes. I like to do pottery. And as for my wife's incredible pottery work, I will hear nothing against it. The castle was created by another kind of family, a team of television producers called Working Dog Films. The film was written in two weeks. It was shot on Super 16 mil in 11 days on a budget of less than a million dollars and it was director Rob Sitch's first foray into filmmaking. It was also Eric Banner's first film. I actually thought someone was taking the piss out of me when I read the script because my dad trained greyhounds and we lived in Tullamarine. 
So when I started reading the script, I thought, this is a bit of a piss take. This is, I find this, you know, a bit close to the bone, you know. I had these masks, which you put over your eyes when you're sleeping, so you can't see anything. Yeah, right? yeah and they were complimentary. Yeah, they were for free. All of us knew people like that and we could relate to it, you know, and, and whether that was your family or someone up the street or your cousins or whatever, it did ring true and that's why I think a lot of people liked it. What do you call this? Chicken. Daryl's character was inspired by Rob Sitch's own father and many of his lines of dialogue were taken from his own family. In my family, we were just in stitches all the time because it was strange and real and heartwarming. It's so sincere and honest and it's, it's terribly funny, but it's not sneer, sneer, nudge, nudge. It's full of love. God, I mean, the filmmakers love them. They love those people. And look at these models. Well, look at them and look at you. I mean, now that is a head of hair. I do go back and revisit films, especially if I get the impression that I've missed out on something. Who ordered medium rare? Me. Good stuff. And that's what Check I did it. with the cast. Very Australian humour. I've got my house and I don't want to move. I think that's the highlight of the great Australian dream. <laughs> Give me one moment. And Doesn't matter, there's it <laughs> next to an airport. You know, I just think that's amazing. What section of the Constitution has been breached? It's the Constitution, it's Mabo, it's justice. It's law, it's the vibe, and, uh, no, that's it, it's the vibe. Let's dig it up. Daryl's fight for justice goes all the way to the High Court. Bud Tingle's speech, I always, have always found that speech to be incredibly moving. It taps into that national theme of the underdog overcoming adversity to restore justice in the world. In favour of the appellant. We won. We won. It's a beautiful portrait of a family. It's very satisfying and you completely understand why it struck a nerve. I'm not a user of social media myself, but it is interesting when you look at the Twitter zone, is that the right word? When the castle was on television not so long ago, people were twittering lines from the film like, consistently funny, warm, lovable. The country has taken the castle to its heart. I mean, in a funny way, it's your own little bit of immortality. I must admit that if I reviewed the castle today, I'd probably give it four stars. What I originally saw as patronising, I now see as affectionate bonds between a tight-knit family. But it's not always like this. In Australia, hundreds of families were systematically torn apart against their will. Rabbit Proof Fence from 2002 is one of Australia's most powerful films. <laughs> I'm authorising the removal. They're to be taken to Moor River as soon as possible. It exposed the shame of a nation. For half of the 20th century, children of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander descent were taken from their homes for their welfare, as was government thinking at the time. They were later called the Stolen Generations. <laughs> Director Philip Noyce had a Hollywood career with films like Patriot Games, The Saint, and Clear and Present Danger. But after reading a screenplay based on Doris Pilkington's novel, Follow the Rabbit Proof Fence, Noyce was determined to return to Australia and tell this story. If you think about where Phil came from in the beginning, university rebel and so on, and marching for Indigenous rights, he was so passionate about the stolen children. Some of the best films about Indigenous people are not made by Indigenous people because it's an outside perspective. And it has just as much right as Samson Delilah in indigenous cinema. Even with a director of Noyce's calibre attached, and in a new century, it was still tricky to get investors excited. The tough subject was a difficult sell. People didn't want to back it. I went and saw a lot of merchant bankers and people like that who 
wanted films with Hollywood stars. They weren't interested in making films with the theme like Rabbit Proof Fence. Behind the scenes, filming the abductions was a harrowing experience for everyone. International star Kenneth Branagh was enlisted to play A.O. Neville, the chief protector. It's morning, isn't it? I know it all feels very strange, but after a few days, you'll feel quite at home. And investors warmed to Noyce's enticing pitch. Philip said, don't think of it as some worthy film. Think of it as like, it's like The Fugitive. It's about three little girls with all the odds against them escaping authority. Where are that rabbit friend? East. But what they know about is the land, so they can escape through the land where the white man is uncertain. In this story, family ties are stronger than state intervention. The girls follow the rabbit-proof fence, the longest fence in the world. An incredible journey of 2,000 kilometres, led by Molly, played by 14-year-old Evelyn Sampy. To hunt them down, the government employs an Aboriginal tracker, superbly played by David Gulpilil. It's Evelyn who's playing Molly, the eldest. Yeah. Evelyn was about the same age as David when he first appeared in the 1971 film Walkabout. Like David, her role was a big one and a milestone in Indigenous representation. The Australian desert is one of the harshest environments I've ever experienced. It's almost unfathomable to think the girls survived and that this was a true story. Molly was the novelist's mother. The girls' determination outsmarts everyone, although I suspected the tracker knew where they were. For many white Australians, it was their first direct experience of the Stolen Generations. The children, I mean, the performances of the kids were just so heartbreaking. And it just showed a different side of uh, Australian history. What happened to those girls is a tragedy, and then part of why the film, I think, is exhilarating is because of their, their resilience. Pretty clever, that girl. <clears throat> the family bond at the core of this story was a breakthrough in understanding the true impact of the stolen generations. I think Rabbit Proof Fence actually does something that speaks to people across language, across class, across all these identities we have at the moment. I love Rabbit Proof Fence. It's one of only two movies that ever, that can make me cry every time I see it. I have the same experience. I know that scene's coming and every time I start convulsing. got a story out there that needed to be told. My grandmother's story, she's part of the Stolen Generations. It put that issue on, a, on an international scale and people were mortified. Film is only ever gonna be a film, but sometimes it can be a, a rallying point, um, a de debating point, and I think that's when a film has additional cultural significance.
rabbit-proof fence helped galvanize momentum for an official apology that came six years later from Kevin Rudd. For the pain, suffering and hurt of these stolen generations, their descendants and for their families left behind, we say sorry. Another film that explores the raising of children is The Devil's Playground. Hey, brother, look at me. <laughs> Only this 1976 movie examines the inner workings of one of Australia's families of faith, the Catholic Church. Gotcha. The story is set in a seminary in 1953, years before revelations of sex abuse in the church. And while the film isn't about this scandal, it is about the cloistered environment that breeds such dysfunctional behavior. Just a second, Alan, what do you think you're doing? Well, I can't watch it properly, brother. Get them on, Alan. You're disgusting, you're exposing yourself. Where's your modesty? If you're to be a little brother of Mary, you must learn that your body is your worst enemy, Alan. It was director Fred Skepsi's first feature film. Close your eyes, you lot. And it's an intensely personal one, inspired by the director's own upbringing. At the age of 13, I thought I had a vocation, so I went to the Morris Brothers Junior, where you go into the monastery and you don't come out until you're a Morris Brother. Think about that. 13, yeah. And then I'm going to come out at 21 and teach young kids about the world. Good luck. <laughs> Skepsi's autobiographical lead character, Tom Allen, is a 13-year-old boy who has left his real family for this surrogate family of brothers. Don't tell me you think they don't masturbate now, Frank. They shouldn't be here. They can't control themselves. In this artificial environment, everyone struggles with chastity. And it becomes even more confusing for the boys who are going through puberty. You got hair yet? A little. So have I. I remember shooting the scene in the greenhouse. It's so fascinating. I remember going to Russia's and seeing all these shots that Fred had done of like legs jiggling and pulling bits of grass. Oh, Tonkins, it's gonna fall off. <laughs> Never leaves it alone, you know. Which of course he didn't get us to do. We were so uncomfortable talking about what we had to talk about. That was what Fred focused on. Wouldn't mind seeing wheels. <laughs> if we lose our battle with temptation, we know what our agony will be. The film was about a kid going through puberty and having to make that very adult choice, which kids should never have to make, between the soul and the flesh. We shall be awash in the burning rivers of the dead. But at the same time, it also explores with some sympathy the situation of the brothers themselves, who struggle with temptation out in the real world. There was a kind of warning in the adult characters because these Catholic priests and seminarians, they're damaged by the weight of orthodoxy, of what these religious rules do to the body. For me, there were like haunting moments. Even the scene with Arthur Dingham, I'd never seen somebody shot underwater in the pool when he was freaking out. I was brought up a Catholic, so I knew a lot of priests. They were very screwed up people. What tricks do you use to keep your bolter at bay, eh? Most were drunks. It's got bloody natural. And I think Fred Skepsi got that right. I hate life. I hate it. It's evil, sick, despicable. Flesh, the body. What use of rules and discipline? The body won't be denied. The body won't be denied. Fred Skepsi went on to make The Chant of Jimmy Blacksmith and Evil Angels, both intense depictions of families under duress, as well as 14 features abroad. It's hard to imagine this incredible body of work might not have existed had Fred stayed in the Brotherhood. The connection I made with The Devil's Playground, of course, was that I'd also been to boarding school. 
Well, this is a photograph taken at Chaffin Grove School in Salisbury in the summer of 1951. And I'm sitting right in the very middle, just behind the headmaster. After lights out in the dormitory, there was no talking. But very early on, I used to get this request, Stratton, tell us a story. All the stories I told were from films I'd seen. So uh, I'd see as many films as I could in the holidays, and then I'd come back to school and, and tell the stories of the, of the films. In a funny kind of way, that's sort of what I've been doing all my life. It's a wonderful movie, I love it. And Ours that's the is show... restaurant. Oh. Okay. Shut up, I've got, it's my oh. line, Adley. Okay. Well, and I was full of enthusiasm, and you okay, cut we'll me off again. the pass. I don't know why I love films so much, but I will be forever grateful that I had the opportunity to share my passion for movies on national television with Margaret Pomeranz. You never make a hairdresser, though, I can tell you that. Starting in 1986 on SBS. Hi, it's movie show time again. I'm Margaret Pomeranz. And I'm David Stratton. Then on the ABC. Good evening. Hi. We appeared each week discussing the latest film releases. It was a remarkable run, but after nearly three decades on air, we finished the show in 2014. Of course, the world was divided between people who agreed with you and people yeah, who agreed with me. I know. Everybody so, who came up to me said, well, actually, I, I, I agree with Margaret always. They say they agree with me always, too. You know how to hurt a person. <laughs> the catalyst of him discovering Margaret Pomerantz to be his sparring partner was a touch of producer genius. This one's for the Raincoat Brigade, don't you think, David? I think this is a very funny film. One half, and it's lucky to get that. So many of us watched it. I mean, I completely understand that these things reach an end, but it's a pity, I think we all miss it. It seems to me that everything that I embrace in this film repels you. Yeah. David and Margaret disagreeing was better than David and Margaret um, agreeing. I can only give it one, because I was very bored. David, what's your mouth Well, I think this is rubbish. That's a classic. Margaret's dirty, smoky laugh. <laughs> Have you laid an egg? <laughs> Margaret's got a lot of heart and emotion. I was sitting there embarrassed and squirming. David is sort of more academic. I think with this film, he's become the cinematic equivalent of a football hooligan. I never missed that show when I was growing up because to me, it was a way of looking at cinema that I wanted to hear. I wanted to hear the way they critique movies. It's a knockout. David, if you didn't love this film... I loved it. <laughs> people who would never listen to a film critic got interested and said, I want to go and see that film. There are deeply divided opinions about our next film tonight. It's an R-rated Australian film, Romper Stomper. <laughs> I've always wanted people to go to see the films that we review. But that kind of influence comes with responsibility. And in the case of this 1992 film about a gang of neo-Nazis, I felt I had a duty of care. Most people had a, a strong reaction to it, one way or another, but, but whether it was negative or positive, they were engaged. No one took their eyes off it. This is not your country. I know that people see it as a racist film. I profoundly disagree. Unlike Margaret, I was troubled by Romper Stomper's extreme violence and promotion of racial supremacy. But the filmmaking was excellent, so I couldn't give it a poor rating. Yet I had to convey my concerns somehow. I can't score it at all, I'm afraid. David took a moral stand about it. He wouldn't give it any stars uh, on his TV program, which I thought was a step too far. This is a dangerous film. Give me a break. But pompous windbag that he was, he did us a great favour. Ironically, my non-score created free publicity, adding to the notoriety around the film. I remember Romper Stomper hitting us in Melbourne like a brick across the head. In one of the kind of films that you talked about, have you seen Romper Stomper? The film frightened me because the toxic beliefs of the gang were presented unopposed. Rich people and powerful people 
brought in boatloads of human trash. The volatile leader of the pack is Hando. This book was written by Adolf Hitler. It's an electric performance from a young Russell Crowe. It's simply about the ongoing struggle of the white race and the enemies it faces. While rehearsing for the role off camera, the intensity of Crowe and his skinhead clan even fooled some cops. We all got arrested as a group one night. We'd been drinking in a, in a pub. And I thought, right, you know, I can just talk to the sergeant, you know, I'll explain this, you know. And I said, look, sorry, sir, but, you know, we're actually actors, you know. I know we've got no hair, I know we've got the boots on and everything, but we're actors, we're making a movie, Garomp Stomp, you know. And he goes, actors, eh? <laughs> yeah, we're just actors, you know. Yes. Well, I hope you're a method actor, son, because you're going to fucking enjoy this. Put him in the cells. <laughs> hey, go. Russell Crowe is the embodiment of the themes that I wanted to explore. That is, there is something raw about Russell, a little bit primitive. He's not afraid to engage his primordial instincts. There was a fire inside of him. Still is. I hope you do, mate, because I don't speak monkey talk. But in Australia at the time, there was a lot of unrest about Asian immigration. I feared the violence in the film would incite copycat crimes. I thought it was an incredibly well-made film, but I, it made me feel uncomfortable because I saw people who looked like me who didn't have a voice and didn't, have, didn't seem to have a character. I didn't connect to it at all, but I could see the skill of the film, so, so you know, I felt conflicted. It was the second feature for Jacqueline McKenzie, and sadly, the last role for Daniel Pollock, who didn't live to see the film's release. Go. We're finished. You're out. Just like that? Yes. You leave me out for her? I have to say that the performances as an actor really kind of leapt off the screen. But it was a beautiful piece of storytelling, and it was incredibly um, forceful and vicious and uh, dynamism, like a, an unstoppable train. Come on. Come on. This was a movie that should be told, not with cowardly editorialising. Let the plot and the consequences of the character's action do the talking. What happened, you mental bitch? Mental bitch! Ah! I heard what you two said! When the film premiered in London, crowds picketed the cinema, calling for a boycott, describing it as a vile and violent work. This proved I wasn't alone in my gut reaction when I first saw the film with Margaret at a market screening in Cannes. There's a story behind that, but I'm not going to embarrass you by telling it. I don't... Tell, tell the story. Embarrass uh, me. You said in Cannes that the negatives should be burned. Yeah. I don't, I don't think I ever said that. <laughs> Two years later, I crossed paths with Geoffrey Wright, who I'd never met before, at a party at the Venice Film Festival. I saw him there, with a glass of wine in his hand, pontificating to several people. Phil Noyce was there, I think, and, and various people. Yeah. And he looked up. I didn't like the way he looked at me. And Geoffrey came in and threw a glass of wine all over me and said, Keep away from my movies. Stay away from my film, you fucker, is what he said. It didn't matter what I said in that moment. I had to say something. David, you know, a filmmaker makes a film. It's like a baby. Yeah. And, you know, us critics sit there and say, well, your baby's ugly. Of course, you know, that's, that's upsetting. But at the same time, you could argue that our viewers, they deserve to be told the truth as we see it. And if I saw him again, I'd do it again, except with a red. <laughs> I mean, it's a subject matter that people find dangerous and they don't really want to talk about. I was very concerned about it, you know? But in that film, opposite to what it felt like it might do, it puts such a spotlight on that series of beliefs and the nihilism of it and that it just wasn't cool anymore. Romper Stomper's focus on the questions of who belongs in Australia is a theme shared in many films about migrant families. The struggle of the new arrival to fit in makes for potent stories about our changing national identity. 
These films give a voice to the many cultures who've landed here since World War II. They all call you Jack. And the Romulus is too hard for them to sign. Romulus was very close to my heart. My father migrated from Croatia and my mother from Germany, so the core idea of these people coming to Australia and hopping off the boat and ending up somewhere other than where they might be used to. So there was a lot of resonance there for me. I grew up not seeing myself on screen. For me, the importance of diversity or seeing yourself on screen, it's, it's a really personal one. Yes, Ma. Not yes, Ma. No, Ma. Be happy. Be happy. <laughs> There are more voices coming from marginal cultures because I think the idea of a, a single monolith is changing. And I think that's kind of exciting. Oh my <laughs> Migrant stories like Head On also include the struggles of the second generation, finding their own voice amid the pressures of their heritage. I say, look at your parents. Hard-working migrants, work two jobs, struggle all your life, buy your kids a house. There, yeah, that's purpose. This film by Greek-Australian director Anna Kokinos is a brave and confronting movie experience. What I wanted to imbue through the story was a, a really kind of intense emotional sense of the character. There's a melancholy to him, a sense that he can never be the conformist that his parents want him to be. He's also dealing with his sexuality. He doesn't want to be labelled as gay. Based on a story by another second-generation Greek, Christoph Selkis, it was a window into contemporary Australia like I'd never seen before. Suddenly, the lights come down and you are immersed in a completely different world. As a young boy of an immigrant of Southern European culture and a homosexual, you know, it was something forbidden and ugly and dangerous. Get a job. Oh, yes, sir. No, sir. Can I have a raise, sir? Can I have a day off, sir? My wife's having a baby, sir. Ari's journey within the book uh, was something that I knew. You know, I was inside this world. I knew this world. I'm embarrassed to be seen with you. Head on was beautifully realised by Anna Kokonov. What did you say to me? It was also very interesting to see this, this very brutal film come from a woman's uh, uh, mind and perspective. It was really... It was powerful. I'm an advocate for people of different backgrounds to be telling their own stories. You just get a different level of understanding and emotional connection. I think I can feel a Greek record coming on. Within the Greek community here, you know, there was a fair bit of hostility towards me about making the film. There, were, there was a view. Hold on a minute, this is the first big Greek Australian film that's been made, you know, in a contemporary sense, and you've gone and made a film about a Greek pufta. You know, how could you do this? Yeah, well, that's his problem. As it started playing in cinemas, a lot of Greek Australians came to me and said, this film has given us the capacity to talk to our parents in a way we've never been able to speak before. We were eternally grateful to our parents for slaving away in factories, but we also needed to sing our own song and be hybrid cultural beings that we were without those burdens, you know. As a young man growing up in England, I also felt the expectations of family duty from my father. In my case, it was to take on the family grocery business that stretched back to 1830, an unbroken line of Strattons for well over a century. 
So in 1965, when I was offered the Sydney Film Festival director's job, I had a huge decision to make. Because on the one hand, it was a dream job. I couldn't have imagined anything I'd rather do. Uh, but on the other hand, I had uh, told my father that I would go back to England um, and work in the company, and, and I felt an obligation to that, so I was very, very torn. After accepting the position, I had to break the news to my father. I don't think I made a phone call at all. Uh, I think I wrote him a letter. My father was beside himself with fury, absolutely. Um, I mean, he was, he was dreadful for a few weeks. Maybe that's something I've shut out of my mind. Another immigrant who left his family behind in Europe and ended up making his name in the Australian film industry is an auteur, arguably Australia's most uncompromising director. Paul Cox is one of this country's most individual and distinctive filmmakers. He came here from Holland in 1963, and over the years, he's made a series of really wonderful human films. How are you, my dear? Uh, very well. I bought some lukewarm coffee. Oh, that's very nice of you. Did you make it yourself? How are you? Ah. Lovely to see you. I've known Paul for 45 years. Today, he's living with terminal cancer. Not that it's stopping him making plans for his next film. And I'm waiting for a miracle now and not to snuff it. You know, I have to now live for a while because I've got a few more things to do and I've got to make this film. It's very important to me. Paul is prolific. He's made 50 films in his unique visual style, often with the same collaborators. His focus has always been on the lives and loves of ordinary people. Film is a bit more than just entertainment to me. Film is the ideal medium to actually say a few things that you can't say any other way. Paul Cox's films are characterized by montages, which suggest a state of mind or emotion. Paul holds a very important place in our film and cultural history. He had the guts to uh, keep making films on very, very low budgets so that his output was, was very strong. His experiments were there for all of us to enjoy. With the Australian film industry renaissance, there were people like Paul Cox making films that offered another sensibility, a more European sensibility. Andreas? Among Paul's huge body of work, one of my favorites is Innocence, from 2000. A story of two lovers who reunite in their late 60s, embarking on an affair as passionate as the first time they fell in love. I always thought, there's so much love wasted between us. And uh, why not make a, a, a film about two elderly people really loving one another? It's a stellar cast, and it's rare to see older characters, some of the least represented people in our cinema, being portrayed with such depth and emotion. You must understand. I understand nothing. What do you think you're doing with my wife? I love her. That's enough to ruin a marriage and my life. John, stop you it. You leave her alone and mind your own business. What about my business? What about me? You are my wife. Oh, let's go. There's no point. Paul's films about personal relationships remind us what it is that makes us human. And Innocence ponders the nature of love across time. What makes a lasting relationship is also the subject of a brilliant 2001 film, Lantana. But this story is an ensemble drama combined with a crime thriller. It centers on a detective, Leon, and his imploding marriage with Sonia, his wife. Leon, Leon, this is about sex. It's about a man and a woman joined, going, going. You get it? It's a sophisticated film from director Ray Lawrence, 
who's only made three features in the last 30 years. Uh, you, you know, you really should have told me that you've, um, that you've got a weak heart. Uh, I don't. It's not, I, it's not the sort of person I want to have an affair with. Is God, for Christ's sake, I don't have a weak heart, all right? And this is not an affair. It's a one-night stand, except it happened twice. It's a film about trust and betrayal and infidelity and how do you stay in a long-term relationship? How do you make it work? How do you love, really? You ever fuck with our marriage and I'll cut your balls off? Hmm? I hang them on the line between your socks and your jocks. I'll only be ten minutes. Just take your own car. Come on, wait for me, please. Jesus. What's wrong? Nothing. I think somehow with Lantana, we did touch on things that people recognised in their own relationships, in their own families. They perhaps couldn't talk about easily. You know, feelings of wanting to betray someone. The feelings you're not supposed to have. <laughs> How's Sonia? She's good. Haven't seen her around for a while. I was excited as an actor. My first, you know, big film, um, where I was in a support lead and Anthony Lepati and Jeffrey Rush. Hi. Hi. Uh. My character was watching Anthony's character and seeing him stuff it all up. So it was about, you've got something great here, mate. Don't, don't stuff it up or you're going to be on your own. It's not that he might have slept with another woman. Mm -hmm. It's that he might not tell me. One of the most skillful aspects of this film is the empathy we're allowed to feel for each character, despite their misdemeanors. I called road service. They said there'd be a 90 minute wait. Where are you? You didn't say you were going to be late. The catalyst for Lantana's whodunit is the mysterious disappearance of Sonia's therapist whom Leon is tasked with finding. Locals get a call at about 12.30 a.m. Uh, from the husband. He gets home late. His wife's not there. I've been through all this with the police. Yes, well, I don't want to put you in any more trouble, but would you mind telling me what happened last night? As the case unfolds, so too does the depth of Leon's infidelity. This could be tricky. Why? I know the woman. Mm -hmm. Change the police. Um, this is Leon. And Claudia. and Claudia Jane. A real pleasure Thank of the you. film is its language. Yeah. It's loaded with layered meanings. You know, you uh, shouldn't have touched the shoe, Mrs. Uh... O'May. It's um, Jane O'May. Right, Mrs. O'May, you shouldn't have touched it. Well, I did. Yeah, but you shouldn't have. Well, I did, didn't I? It's on the table. Watching the dialogue-driven scenes yes. that reveal so much yes. about the character's motivations, it's easy to understand that it began life as a play. I had somebody I could talk to. And I have it, to tell you something. I have to tell you. I had an affair. Most of the great classic plays, a lot of them about f families not working, basically. They say you've um, hurt some woman, Nick. Did not babe? I didn't touch her. While observing the other couples deal with the tragedy, Leon reflects on his own marriage. It's not that he might have slept with another woman. Leon is clearly going through an enormous emotional trial, yet doesn't quite have the words to articulate that. Do you still love him? It's just so heartbreaking. Many people have probably experienced that with their personal relationships. It's so easy to go out and find somebody. You know what's hard? What's hard is not to. And all the, the, the tug of war of do I stay, do I go? No, she's still pissed off at you. Do I forgive? Right, uh, do you forget? Look, tell her, uh, tell her I'll be home soon. All right, see you, Dad. What did he say? He said to say that he's sorry, that he loves you, and he wants you to stop being angry with him. Lantana was a success with audiences and critics alike.
Perhaps because it arrived in a decade when divorce was rising at an unprecedented rate in Australia, Lantana spoke to viewers who well knew the complex realities of modern love. It started in 12 cinemas and suddenly, within a couple of weeks, it was playing in 100 cinemas. We didn't expect that. People sat talking for 20 minutes after, and you don't, you don't see that in the theater. Who are you fucking? Mark. Everyone. We <laughs> a fucking problem. Relationship woes also form part of another genre in Australian film. Crime. That's my boy. One in the skull. <laughs> the distinctive thing about Australian crime is that it's bedded in ordinary domesticity. I told you not to play with that, right? Dad's got a split bloody headache. You're in, you're in. Say cheese. cheese. In our films, lawbreakers are seen as part of the family unit. Oh, no. They didn't have you in a cell, did they, Brett? What do you think jail is, Mum? We're no holiday camp. Yeah. Oh. What makes these stories so powerful is that their underworlds feel close to home. What you do is my business, all right? You're coming to me. Get your hands off me, bro. Let him go, bro. Mind your own fucking business! So fucking let him go, bro. Ah, oh, shit, guys, you just missed him. That's all right. I like you better. He's got a gun! One of my favourite films from 2010 is Animal Kingdom, from first-time director David Michaud. One of the ways in which I thought this movie might be a little bit different, it's a crime film, but really it's a crime film about a family of armed robbers in which you never see them commit an armed robbery. What you're seeing is them, the, their, their last days. The show reinvented the crime picture effectively with Animal Kingdom. The menacing mood created in Animal Kingdom is terrifying and masterful. Here, evil exists in the everyday. We like to observe the dark side of life. I've met a number of crims in my time at different times. They've always been, you know, characters, charming characters. I wouldn't want to rely on them. Hello? Oh, hello, darling. No, one of those days, having a bloody crisis. I remember when I did Two Hands. I'm playing origami with my kid. Morris? Fine. You know, at the same time I'm on the phone, I say, Yeah, fucking where? Yeah, make sure you kill a bastard. That's a lovely looking pterodactyl. You always read about these killers or whatever, and they go, He was such a nice bloke. I used to see him playing with his children. Well, he probably did. You, know? you ever shot a gun before? I'm going to pick up the outfield. Another feature of Australian crime is that the films are often based on real events or characters. Feel good? Films like Snowtown from 2011. You want to shoot it? And Chopper from 2000. Oh. I'd known of Chopper and because I grew up in Melbourne, so I knew who he was when, when the phone call came through. Come on, Chopper, we've got to get him to a hospital. So you took him to the hospital? No, I didn't take him to the bloody hospital. And I just had an immediate gut reaction. I was like, I know who that guy is. I've seen him on TV. I could be him. Do I look like Mark Brennan and Medicare Reed or something? All right, who's bloody driving? Oh, Always felt like something that was dangerous and controversial, and that's what made it made it exciting. You're walking around with one foot in the fucking grave. Get in, you fucking golly woman. And the fascination with real criminals goes all the way back to one of the most famous anti-heroes Australia ever produced. Ned Kelly. I'm sure I've heard that name somewhere. I'm sure you have, sir. I'm here to see an important artefact in the Ned Kelly legend. Many people flock to see Ned Kelly's helmet. But I'm going to show you something far more precious, buried deep in the vaults of the National Film and Sound Archive. This looks pretty unassuming, but in fact it's incredibly exciting and incredibly important because this is a reel from the first feature film made anywhere in the world. And it was made here in Australia, the story of the Kelly Gang, made in 1906. 
Of poor convict Irish stock, the Kelly family saw themselves downtrodden by the Victorian police. Aided and abetted by his mother and sister, Ned Kelly and his gang were the most famous outlaws of their day. Only a few precious fragments of the original film survive, but altogether it would have run over an hour, making it the first feature film in the world. When this film was made, Hollywood didn't even exist. There was no film industry, really, anywhere in the world. The film was directed by showman entrepreneur Charles Tate, with his brothers, the writers and producers. They were just making it up as they went along. They had to stage the scenes, frame them, shoot them, how the actors would behave. It was all, it was all completely and utterly new. Their bold adventure changed the course of world cinema forever. The film's exciting scenes depicted the Kelly Gang's infamous armed hold-ups that were already the stuff of Bushranger legend. It must have had a tremendous impact for audiences here in Australia at the time. Just imagine seeing the story of Ned Kelly at a time when Ned Kelly's mother, for example, was still alive. The story has inspired many remakes. That bastard Kerno, he must have warned them. Of varying quality. Cover the corners. Fight me. Come and get me if that's what you want. Oh, me, Ned Kelly. Throw down your arms. Throw down this. <laughs> Fire! But my favourite is Gregor Jordan's 2003 version for its handsome production and the truth to the legend. It starred Heath Ledger. When the story of the Kelly Gang was released on Boxing Day 1906, it was billed as the sensation of the year, the greatest, most thrilling moving picture. The notorious shootout at the Glen Rowan Hotel is the climax to the Kelly story. Australia's legendary figure in his handmade armor symbolizes the anti-authoritarian myth that forms a core of our identity. <laughs> the core of my identity has always been film. For 54 years, I've championed Australian cinema, reviewing thousands of movies and writing three books. Tonight on this Australia Day, uh, something very, very exciting for David Stratton. I never craved official accolades for my work. Uh, he has been honoured in the Australia Day honours list. David Stratton, AO. Nonetheless, I'm hugely grateful and humbled by the awards. As a small boy, I never imagined this life was ahead of me because my family didn't understand my passion for cinema. So the moment that really meant the most to me happened in 1987, while on a trip to Europe, when I saw my parents. They came down to meet me at the end of the Cannes Festival. And I noticed there was a couple at another table that were looking at me, and they said to me, oh, David, we're from Melbourne, and we, we watch you uh, on television, the movies you host, and so on, and they, they're wonderful. And my mother, said, he's my son. <laughs> that still chokes me up. Australia is the country that adopted me. So perhaps it's not surprising, my all-time favourite Australian film is one that promotes the idea of our unique voice. That bloke, your brother? Yeah. Why do you need the company? Because he's a disloyal, self-seeking bastard, that's why. Newsfront mixes real newsreel footage with dramatised scenes in a story about rival brothers played by Bill Hunter and Gerard Kennedy, who are camera operators shooting news in the post-war years. One sells out to Hollywood. The other is a patriotic Australian. Everyone expects that you're going to go and live in LA and do that. But in doing things like Newsfront, 
that was pretty exciting to me. I always knew you were a gutless wonder. I love playing those characters. To not play them and let some other Australian bastard play them didn't seem right. This film says something powerful to us in the film industry. It says, be confident. Get stuffed. No, no, I'll go further. I'm inviting you to bite your bum. Oh, come on, Len. You know, you, you want to find out who we are, you go back through our cinema. I think we make some of the best cinema in the world here. You know, there are some very talented people. Film projectors project so much more than stories. They beam our identity and values, and ultimately, our dreams. You know, the story of who we are seems to become more complex as we go on. <laughs> we are so multicultural, and all these stories that are yet to be found and told, you know, it's exciting for what our future can be. And we have to support each other, and we have to keep it alive. It's important that we tell our own stories and make our own films. Otherwise, you're a voiceless nation. You're mute. So go on. Treat yourself. Go and see an Australian film. See you at the movies.